Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's panel from Support to Governance, Global Anti-Corruption Pathways, as part of the program put on today by the Carter Center on Multifaceted Approaches to Prevent Corruption and Enhance Accountability. My name is Rebecca Schutt. I am the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions, and it is a privilege to be your moderator today. May I start out by extending our greatest thanks, um, deep gratitude to the entire Carter Center team that has put together today's phenomenal program, um, including our event as well as many other panels that I hope you'll stay for throughout the afternoon. Today's panel recognizes that cooperation among and between states on investigative and prosecutorial strategies to combat corruption has advanced significantly in recent years. However, there are still lacunae in the judicial framework and legal opening for an international anti-corruption court, an independent entity with the subject matter jurisdiction, expertise, and resourcing needed to combat endemic grand corruption. We have assembled a panel for you today of esteemed experts with various perspective on anti-corruption approaches that we hope will weave together a patchwork quilt that paints a little bit of a picture of why an international anti-corruption court is necessary. Before we begin, I would like to tell you a little bit about my organization and our co-hosting organization, Integrity Initiatives International. Citizens for Global Solutions is a non-governmental, non-profit, um, partisan membership-based organization in consultative ECOSOC status. For more than 75 years, we've brought together a diverse collective of individuals and actors with a common goal of a democratic world federation predicated upon peace, human rights, and the rule of law. Grand corruption is obviously a scourge to all of these values. And while we were established a year before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose anniversary we celebrate this week, by some of the greatest minds and peace champions of the last century, including Albert Einstein, Ben Ferenz, William Fulbright, Norman Cousins, to may, uh, name just a few, now we bring this um, initiative, our principles to the 21st century, and contemplate new judicial institutions and pathways towards democratic world federation. We are privileged to do this in partnership with Integrity Initiatives International, whose mission is to strengthen the enforcement of criminal laws to punish and deter leaders who are corrupt and regularly violate human rights, and also to create opportunities for the democratic process to replace them. They have been the predominant champions of the initiative for an international anti-corruption court, about which you will hear more momentarily. I will briefly introduce our panel, um, and as each of them takes their turn for their intervention, I will give you a little bit more about their biography. And we're pleased to have Judge Dr. Claudia Escobar, the Vice Chair of Integrity Initiatives International, as our first speaker. She'll be followed by Justin Snyder, who's the Chief of Party of USAID's Integritas for Partnership for Glo Governance Reform in Indonesia. Hilary Forden, the Senior Associate Director of the Rule of Law Program here at the Carter Center. Cynthia Gabriel, who is the founder of the Center to Combat Corruption and Cronyism, and also a senior anti-corruption advisor at the Center for Independent Private Enterprise. And Slagyana Tasova, who is the chair of Transparency in, in International Macedonia, and is a board member of the International Academic Advisory Board in the International Anti-Corruption Academy. Our first speaker, um, Dr. Claudia Escobar, will speak to the lessons that we can learn from hybrid mechanisms to combat corruption and how they will be applied to an international anti-corruption court. She speaks from her personal experience as um, a member of CISIG um, and also as a former magistrate of the Court of Appeals of Guatemala. She is currently a distinguished visiting professor at the Scar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. And following her second election to the Court of Appeals in 2014, she became the lead whistleblower in a case of grand corruption that revealed illegal interference in Guatemala's judiciary by high ranking of political officials, including the country's vice president and the former president of Congress. She's also the founder of several organizations dedicated to promoting the rule of law in Guatemala. So if I may give the floor now to Dr. Claudia Escobar. Thank you. Thanks to the Carter Center and to the Citizens for Global Solutions for organizing this panel. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Um, today I would like to share 
uh, my perspectives on how the international hybrid mechanisms can help to combat corruption. I will focus mainly on the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, but before I do that, I would like to give you a very short background of Guatemala and also share some of my personal experience in the judiciary and discuss how corruption affects the judicial sector. First, the background of Guatemala. Guatemala is a post-conflict country. We suffered a long civil war for almost 40 years from the early 60s. The peace accord was signed in December of 1996, but we all know that um, the culture of legality doesn't happen with the signature of, of a document. It really needs to be promoted and protected. And the, le the legacy of the civil war was impunity, inequity, and insecurity, violence. The judicial system was weak and lack of judicial independence. But after the peace accords were signed, a window of opportunity opened to build democracy and strengthen institutions. It was a time of hope. There was an effort to strengthen the judicial system. The constitution was reformed. And there was a, a new generation of judges that wanted to, to make a change. Guatemala has a long history of good relations with many nations that have tried to help the country in different ways. The international community wanted to help build, rebuild the country, strengthen institutions. We have the help of the US, of Spain, Canada, Germany, uh, the European Union, ma many countries. They promoted different projects. And the United Nations was also involved, and they helped set up a special mission to help implement the peace agreements, which include the strength of the judiciary. After the war, the international community, well, uh, helped us, as, as I said, and I was um, admitted in the School of Judges. They helped to set up a special um, project to build a School of Judges. Many people consider Guatemala, well, uh, to be a, a poor country. We are a small country, but it's a country with a lot of potential that has been really plundered by terrible rulers who have usually become millionaires after being in power. Politicians use all their power to take advantage of the um, institutional weakness and promote corruption, and that has brought the country to the worst institutional crisis in the history. The level of impunity is between 95% to 98 That means that it's really a paradise for criminal activities. And its geographical um, location facilitates of all of illegal commerce from South to North America. According to INL, many areas of the country, especially along Guatemala borders, are under the influence of drugs, trafficking organizations. Guatemala confronts an array of transnational criminal organizations involved in alien smuggling, trafficking in persons, money laundering, armed trafficking, and extortion, just to name a few. If any of you will live in a place where violence is common, you will know that citizens are always at risk. Public safety is an issue of greatest concern for Guatemala citizens, and there is almost no family that has not been a victim of different types of violence. Being a judge in a country like that is not like being a judge in Germany, in the US, in Canada, or in other countries that their life is protected. In 2006, a hybrid mechanism to fight corruption and impunity was created by the UN and the Guatemalan government. I have to uh, highlight that that was the Guatemalan government who asked the United Nations for help to address the problem of impunity. That was not imposed by the international community. That's how the International Commission Against Impunity was created. It's known as CICIG. It started functioning in the country in 2007, the same year that I was appointed as a judge. The CSIC mandate was terminated in September 2018 after they investigated more than 300 cases of grand corruption. After that, a backslash of all the efforts to strengthen the judicial institutions took place. So, I would like to talk about what it means uh, when we talk about corruption in the judiciary. We know that Transparency International has defined corruption as the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. But when we refer 
To corruption in the judicial sector, we are referring to misuse of power and authority by judicial officials for personal gain. This can take many forms, including accepting bribes, providing favorable ruling, and covering up crimes. Judicial corruption means that all forms of inappropriate influence that may damage the impartial of the justice and may involve any actor with the justice system, included but not limited to judges, lawyers, administrative court staff, of parish and public servants. It's also important to consider the ethic of the judges. Their behavior will depend on their principles of integrity. Judicial officials must be bound to ethical codes. An ethical judge will not accept any influence for his or her decisions. If the judiciary is corrupt, it's very difficult to sanction corruption in other sectors. If we compare corruption to cancer, corruption in the judiciary is the worst type of cancer. It's metastatic cancer. It's like cancer spreads to all over other organizations. It's one of the most perversive forms of corruption because it destroys the credibility of the justice system. By losing confidence in the judges, prosecutors, or other authorities that are obligated to enforce the law, the rule of law and legal certainty are destroyed. Societies could return to the West Wild, where the strongest rules. It falls into abuse of power and authoritarianism. In addition, when justice institutions are undermined by corruption, there is no way to guarantee other human rights, since impartiality and objectivity are lost. And if the independence of the justice is lost, democracy and the fight against corruption are lost too. I want to share some of my personal experience in the judiciary. As a judge, I had to confront clerks. I'd witnessed how clerks explored their, and used the justice system, extorting um, in exchange for um, scheduled hearings, influence the outcomes of a resolution, very simple types of corruption. That is like petite corruption in the courts. I had to denounce these acts, and the first time I did it, I received death threats in my court from the same clerks that, that were working with me. Then I also saw lawyers and how lawyers were using the system to enrich themselves and to manipulate the system for their own gain. Again, I had to denounce that, and I also received death threats. They came to my court with bulletproof cards and with um, gun arms to try to intimidate me. I still remain working in the judicial system. The third time I had to confront uh, corruption in judiciary when, was when the head of the Congress tried to bribe me for a resolution in, um, in favor of the Vice President Roxana Valdetti at the time. I also denounced him, and this time I had to leave my country and come in exile to the US nine years ago um, for denouncing him. He, was, um, he faced a trial and he was sentenced for 14 years of jail for influence pendling and, and corruption. But I am not the only uh, judicial official in exile now. After CC left, the backslash that happened in my country forced every official that was working to enhance the, um, the judicial system and that was working close with the CC to leave the country. The ones that remain in the country are in prison right now. Um, Amnesty International has declared one of the lawyers that is in prison a prisoner of conscience and, and a political prisoner for just for working for the um, uh, special unit in the um, uh, public minister, and and she's been in in prison for two years. So. Right now, the Attorney General is considered an anti-democratic and corrupt official by the State Department of the US, and is included in the Engels list. That is a list to name um, public officials that favor corruption. So when do a country need an international hybrid mechanism to fight corruption? Is when the judicial institutions are weak or are inefficient, when the executive or the legislative control the judiciary, when organized crime has infiltrated institutions, when honest and um, judicial officials are threatened. So when we have all the above is when we have endemic corruption. And that's when we really need to think about how can we ask the international community to build um, different uh, mechanisms to, to address corruption. And organized crime is not the only um, 
sector or the, or the only groups that can infiltrate or, um, judicial institutions that benefit from impunity. There's also crypto kleptocratic actors that will benefit from um, weak institutions. There's also arming people that work in the, during the civil war that were violators of human rights that also promote corruption to benefit themselves. And sadly, also economic elites that have used the system to enrich themselves, to pay very low wages, not to pay taxes. So they want to continue in a system that will benefit. So what a hybrid mechanism like CSIG can do? They can influence legal reforms. They can help strengthen judicial institutions in different aspects, like creating uh, capacities for uh, prosecutors, for judges. And they can accompany and empower judicial officials to carry out their work. They can protect judicial officials from different threats and retaliation from these powerful groups that want to undermine their power. Um, during the role of the CCIG in Guatemala, I can identify four different um, stages. The first stage was when Carlos Castresana, a prosecutor from Spain, uh, started the commission. They, they really helped to address different uh, um, problems, and especially they promote uh, legislative reform for anti-corruption reforms. Then came the, the moment of um, Francisco de la Nese, a prosecutor from, from Costa Rica. He was in office from 2010 to 2013, and he focused on strengthening the capacities of the prosecutors. Then came the um, appointment of Iván Velázquez, who was the last commissioner from September 2013 to 2018, and he focused on fighting corruption. He couldn't have done his work without the previous work that the other commissions have done in the reforms of, of many laws. Um, but since 2017, when he found out that the president was also involved in high cases of corruption, a systematic attack on CSIC was started as a response from all the illicit political economic networks. Right now, most of the cases that they investigated were closed without proper investigation. So that's my remarks for how um, CSIC work in the country. Uh, thank you so much for your remarks, Dr. Escobar. Um, this is a, a paradigmatic case of what we can learn from hybrid tribunals, or excuse me, hybrid systems, um, both in terms of their positive contributions, including the more than 70 cases that CISIG successfully brought to justice during its um, existence, but also what happens after uh, a hybrid mechanism is disbanded. And now we're going to go across the globe for um, another case study from Indonesia of what happened when the Indonesian Corruption Eradication Commission um, was, was decommissioned. And we're going to hear from Justin Snyder, who's the chief of party of USAID Integritas for Partnership for Governance. He has previously worked for the International Foundation for Electoral Systems and Management Systems International. Justin, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, good noon, midday to everybody. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, thanks so much to Rebecca uh, and her team uh, and to the team at Triple I for inviting me to speak here. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, in Atlanta for the COSP, and uh, we're so uh, thankful to have uh, the opportunity to talk about this important topic today. Um, maybe before we begin, I, I, I think there are a lot of parallels between uh, my presentation and uh, Dr. Escobar's. Uh, I think it is helpful uh, for many of us in the room to have kind of a reminder of, of where Indonesia is, what it is. Um, Indonesia is the fourth most populous country in the world. It has a population of 275 million people. Um, so it's not a small place. Uh, it's also uh, geographically huge. In, in US terms, it would stretch from uh, LA to uh, New York. Uh, but it's spread out over 14,000 islands, uh, which makes it a very difficult uh, geography uh, to maintain effective government systems. Um, importantly as well, uh, coming out of the late 90s, uh, we had kind of the triple uh, whammy of uh, the Asian financial crisis, uh, we had a transition to democracy, uh, and we also had 
uh, several uh, brewing religious-based and, and sectarian uh, civil conflicts going on. Uh, thankfully, uh, since then, Indonesia has returned to a period of relative stability. Uh, it has made incredible progress in its fight against corruption, uh, but I think as you'll see, uh, there is uh, considerable work uh, yet to be done. So. Um, I think that kind of takes us uh, through the current state of affairs. I will try to focus my remarks uh, today on the Corruption Eradication Commission, or KPK. Uh, a small correction, it has not been disbanded, uh, but it has been seriously undermined, and, and we'll uh, get into that uh, in the slides ahead. So we're currently experiencing uh, a crisis both in, in leadership and legitimacy. Um, and I think there's a lot of connections between uh, my comments and, and Dr. Escobar's. Uh, as you'll see in a few moments, uh, a lot of this stems from backlash, uh, and there are also elements of this uh, destruction of public trust. Uh, we have uh, two commissioners uh, who have, uh, it, overall, there are five commissioners that sit on this independent uh, body, or formerly independent body. Uh, Lily Sirigar uh, resigned last year in July of 2022 under her third consecutive ethics scandal. Uh, she was replaced by uh, Mr. Johannes Tanak, uh, who only months into his term uh, faced an ethics inquiry for improper contact with the target of a corruption uh, investigation. Uh, he was cleared of that ultimately, but uh, I think uh, within Indonesia, most people view that uh, as a very questionable decision. And then just uh, at the end of last month, uh, in late November, uh, the uh, chair of the commission, Firli Bahuri, uh, was indicted on charges of extortion. Uh, the case is ongoing, and uh, I will uh, try to maintain a presumption of innocence. But what is, what is interesting uh, about this current situation is this is not the first time that criminal charges have been brought against commissioners on this commission. Uh, however, I think there's a broadly held view uh, in Indonesia uh, that this is the first time that uh, charges are legitimate or certainly not manufactured with the aim of hamstringing uh, the work of the institution. So uh, I, I think maybe we should uh, take a look at how did we get here. Uh, we're, we're now at a, a time of all-time low public trust. Um, we see, I know it may be difficult to see on the, on the screen a little bit, uh, since the change in the KPK law in 2019, uh, which is an important uh, date that we will come back to, uh, we've seen a, a steep decline uh, in public trust. Um, the green and black lines uh, are the military and the president, and they've maintained very uh, high levels uh, of uh, public trust. Uh, those are institutions that uh, traditionally maintain that level of public trust. Uh, but what I think is interesting here is the, the blue and the red lines, uh, which represent the KPK and the police. Um, and they've both seen a significant drop. Uh, the KPK had always been one of the most trusted public institutions up until uh, 2019 uh, when the law was changed. Um, I did point out this kind of vertical dotted line uh, is the, the point in time at which there were two high profile cases involving police misconduct. Uh, there was a high profile murder uh, and cover up uh, and a separate distribution of confiscated narcotics cases uh, and that's I think that's an important reference point to show that even after those two high-profile scandals, uh, public trust in the Anti-Corruption Commission is now on par uh, with the police. So how did we get here? Where, where are we coming from? So the KPK was set up in 2002, uh, and up to 2019 was recognized as a, as a standout uh, in Asia. It was on par with the Hong Kong uh, Anti-Corruption Commission, uh, and it was a really hard-charging uh, organization. Uh, they had a 100% uh, conviction rate uh, up until relatively recently. Um, their case criteria, I think, are important uh, for us to, uh, to understand as well. Uh, cases that they take on uh, have to involve uh, corruption or money laundering. They have to involve law enforcement or public officials, and they have to uh, involve state losses over a particular threshold. It's about $70,000. Um, generally, they have been understaffed, but very high, uh, highly performing uh, with the resources that they have been given, uh, and up to 2019, uh, highly popular. Um, they do, I think it's important in, in terms of context to understand that they do handle uh, a relatively small portion of cases, uh, corruption cases within the country. We have the Attorney General's office uh, in kind of the red bars on the left, uh, the KPK in the middle, and the police on the right. 
Uh, but it's, under, it's important to understand the cases that they are handling are fewer in number, uh, but they are these grand corruption cases. They achieved a number of very important, very high profile wins. Uh, they took on, uh, here on the left, we have the treasurer of uh, then sitting president's uh, political party. Uh, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison for his role in a grand corruption scheme. Uh, Setio Novanto, uh, who was then Speaker of the House, uh, was another high-profile win for the Commission. Uh, they put him away for 15 years. Uh, the Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court was sentenced to prison for his role in a bribery scandal. Uh, and I think that that scandal is important because it, was, it, it involved the buying and selling of judicial decisions in electoral disputes. Uh, and so we see this very clear overlap between uh, corruption, uh, the judiciary, and, and the political spheres. Um, as I mentioned, one of their big successes uh, was not only in taking on these high-profile cases, but establishing significant levels of public trust. And, and those are uh, relatively mutually reinforcing uh, kind of aims uh, or, or outcomes. Uh, but more than that, the KPK, uh, through its engagement with creative communities, with youth, with rock bands, uh, made the commission incredibly popular. It, it actually made, for one of the first times in Indonesia, fighting corruption feel cool, and it instilled a, a tremendous sense of, of public hope. Um, in 2019, they staged 30 separate sting operations, and these often uh, result in uh, high-profile, shocking, and irrefutable proof uh, of government uh, malfeasance. Uh, unfortunately, the government often viewed these operations as embarrassments um, and were generally unappreciative of the uh, efforts to root out bad apples within the system. Um, and so public support was, was a key part of uh, their protection against backlash. Now, so we, we started at the top of this presentation looking at where we are. How did we get to where we are right now? Um, well, there were a, a couple of key uh, moments in the timeline. Uh, number one, there was a wholesale leadership change in 2019, and I think that's a lesson for any, any independent anti-corruption commission is that promoting uh, effective uh, kind of steady changes in leadership rather than wholesale uh, all five commissioners all at one go uh, is, a, is an incredibly politically risky uh, gamble uh, rather than having staggered terms that promotes more continuity. Uh, but we had a, a wholesale leadership change uh, that resulted in uh, commissioners of, of rather questionable backgrounds uh, rising to the top and being reinstated. Um, then a month later, in October 2019, uh, we had a fundamental change uh, to the Commission's uh, mandate. It removed the Commission's uh, status as an independent body, making it part of the executive. Uh, as part of that, there was an uh, oversight council uh, that was established, uh, which is conveniently uh, directly appointed by the President. Uh, and it's through that oversight council that all permissions for raids, uh, sting operations, wiretaps uh, have to pass. So it puts a, a tremendous amount of uh, control, uh, albeit somewhat indirect, in the hands of the president. Um, furthermore, they're no longer allowed to employ independent investigators, um, and all staff must be civil servants. Uh, and that has had, I, I had a discussion with a, a current investigator on the way uh, here, traveling from Indonesia, uh, and he said that has had a, a very profound effect uh, in the staff's uh, ability to raise issues, uh, raise complaints, uh, because now they are within the civil service and they feel to be no longer independent. Uh, and finally, uh, the law change gave them the authority to drop an investigation, which is part of its success in the early years. Once an investigation started, they had to see it through and bring it to court. And now, with the ability to drop cases, uh, it opens up a whole new uh, opportunity for misuse. Along with the staffing change, can we go to the next slide, please? There we go. Uh, there was a staff purge in, in May of 2021 uh, in which a number of uh, very qualified, highly regarded investigators were pushed out through a very dubious uh, citizenship test. Um, and it, this kind of goes back to why we see the KPK and the police uh, neck and neck in terms of public trust is because many of those who were pushed out 
were ultimately returned to the police, which is uh, ironically where they were from uh, institutionally. Um, and so the police has seen its credibility actually come up because they have become, in many ways, the sanctuary uh, for those who were pushed out uh, through a largely well, uh, illegitimate move. Now, we've seen this have a dramatic effect on Indonesia's uh, CPI scores. Uh, we see uh, the, the change of the law is this vertical uh, reference line here, and we see a very steep drop uh, in uh, Indonesia's scores uh, from that point. Uh, we had our steepest drop uh, with the release of the uh, new figures uh, in 2022. So uh, what are some lessons learned? What are some of the things that we can take away? Uh, the, the KPK has been a, a wonderful international partner. It has received tremendous amounts of support through the U.S. government, uh, both through the Department of Justice and through U.S. aid programs like the, one, uh, the ones that I have previously worked on uh, and the ones that I'm uh, working on now. Uh, but one of the things that we see is that people power had always been a key element of the KPK's defense against external pressure and external threats to, to its mandate. Uh, but uh, through the, the changes in the law and then the changes in leadership, that people power has largely been squandered uh, and completely undermined. Um, and that people power has been blunted by a, a political elite that is uh, not genuinely interested in representing the people's interests, uh, but are pushing a much more uh, pragmatic legacy. So what can be done? Uh, I think uh, th this is uh, going to be something that we're all going to hear a lot uh, throughout this week, is uh, working to identify and support champions within institutions and across the government. I do want to be clear that uh, although there are problems with leadership at, at the KPK, um, not everybody who works at the KPK uh, is, has been corrupted. Uh, there are some wonderful, dedicated, hardworking people uh, who continue to pursue cases, uh, and we are eager to support them. Um, the 2024 elections that are coming up, uh, starting in February, uh, I think uh, most observers would say that we're going to head into a second round uh, later in the year. I think those offer a key inflection point uh, for the Indonesian public uh, to help uh, set uh, the, the future direction of anti-corruption movements uh, in the country. Um, I think it's important to continue to provide robust support uh, and unrestricted kinds of support to civil society. Many donor funds uh, don't allow for supporting strategic litigation, uh, for example, and I think that's a key limitation that many of us face. Investigative journalism uh, offers a, a main avenue uh, for uncovering and monitoring and holding uh, people in power to account. Uh, and things like uh, UNCAC uh, are, uh, are key elements. I think that the changes to the revision of the KPK law uh, present a, a pretty direct uh, connection uh, to, I believe, it's uh, Article 36 on the independence uh, of, of uh, Article 36. Uh, on the independence of uh, independent bodies. So uh, I'll leave it there. I'll try to leave some room for, for Q&A and uh, yield the rest of my time to the other members of the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Justin. Um, having heard a little bit about the fragility of both hybrid and domestic mechanisms to combat corruption, we're going to turn now to a topic and um, a speaker that may be familiar to, to several of you in this room. Here we are at the Carter Center, which is what lessons can be extrapolated from foreign assistance in legal and judicial anti-corruption initiatives. Um, so we're going to hear from Hilary Forden, who is the Senior Associate Director for the Rule of Law Program here at the Carter Center. She's a lawyer and development practice with more than 15 years of experience in the rule of law development, post-conflict justice, and criminal law. Prior to joining the Carter Center, she consulted on Department of State and US funded, USAID-funded anti-corruption and legal education projects. And she was previously a senior technical advisor for the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. Uh, Hillary, I am sorry, I just in the interest of time, I will truncate the rest of your bio and give you the floor. <laughs> How does this work? Is this working? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, that was plenty long enough. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> and um, thank you um, for, to Citizens for Global Solutions and um, Triple I for this invitation to speak today. Um, 
looking at uh, these proposals for standalone um, anti-corruption courts, either at a regional or international level, um, I reflect on uh, the role that courts occupy in um, the fight against corruption, because they can be both part of the problem and part of the solution. So obviously on the one hand, courts play an essential role in holding corrupt actors criminally and civilly accountable. Um, but on the other hand, people don't want to use courts that they perceive to be corrupt. And um, earlier this week at the Civil Society Forum, uh, one of the panelists um, I heard said um, say that 84% of women and girls who have experienced gender-based violence in Haiti hold the opinion that the courts are corrupt and therefore do not seek redress through the courts. Uh, so with that in mind, um, there is growing evidence that indirect approaches to addressing corruption in the justice sector, such as transparency, accountability, integrity, and access to information, um, may actually be preferable to or more effective than direct anti-corruption approaches. So to help build public trust from the outset, a new international or regional anti-corruption court um, should think about embedding principles of transparency, accountability, and integrity into its operations from the outset. And this could include uh, strong ethical standards, codes of conduct, which is something that Judge Escobar spoke about, um, vetting of judges and court staff, uh, establishing a transparent and publicly accessible case management system, digitizing court processes, uh, establishing strong internal governance system and uh, transparency in recruitment and human resources practices. Um, also, any new standing anti-corruption um, bodies uh, should consider adopting a more people-centered approach. Um, this means ensuring that anti-corruption efforts address people's day-to-day -day justice needs and center the victims of corruption. Um, whereas the victims of other international criminal tribunals um, have been quite visible uh, due to their numbers and the physical harm many of them have suffered, too often corruption is considered to be a victimless crime. And a standing anti-corruption court cannot ignore the victims of corruption. Um, to be people-centered, any standing anti-corruption body should treat justice as a service and be designed with the users of that service in mind. And so this may mean ensuring um, that any sort of anti-corruption court is user-friendly, solution-focused, prevention-oriented, data-driven, and focused on problem-solving. Um, Next, I'd like to turn to kind of the format of um, assistance to a um to a standing anti-corruption body. Um, historically, most development assistance to justice institutions charged with combating corruption has focused on technical assistance and training to increase justice sector actors' capacity to investigate, prosecute, and adjudicate corruption cases. But this approach assumes that those working in these institutions want to reform and are uh, only failing to hold corrupt actors accountable because they lack the resources or the capacity to do so. Um, it ignores the political dynamics, underlying power structures, and diverse interests and incentives that drive individual and group behavior. Um, today, development organizations understand that we need to think about um, the, we need to think and work politically to counter corruption. Learning from this experience, um, assistance to and design of a standing anti-corruption court um, should also be informed by political economy analysis, which in this case might need to be global or at least transnational, whereas a lot of PEA has traditionally be domestic. Um, but this means understanding the complex web of individuals, entities, and entities that promote and oppose reforms to combat corruption, um, including powerful interests that support or oppose a standing anti-corruption court. Um, for example, uh, PEA could actually maybe help anticipate the kind of backlash that we saw in CSIG in Guatemala um, against a, a standing international court. Um, Technical assistance may still be required, um, especially in complex cases involving issues such as illicit finance, network analysis, asset forfeiture, or more RICO-style cases. That said, the international community um, should take a do-no-harm approach to any technical assistance provided to a standing anti-corruption body, I think at any level. Um, in the development context, we've learned that strengthening institutional capacity can actually help 
facilitate authoritarianism. So while this may be less likely in the case of an international anti-corruption court that has diverse interests involved, it nevertheless, um, such a court still could have the potential to be weaponized um, the way powerful and corrupt actors have actually weaponized courts in the United States. Um, and um, finally, I would, next I would say that development assistance um, to a standing anti-corruption body should take a multi-sectoral approach. Um, support should not be limited to the anti-corruption court itself, but rather paired with support um, to journalists and civil society organizations who can simultaneously call attention to corruption cases that are not being addressed at the national level um, that could be referred to a regional or international body, as well as serve as watchdogs over the anti-corruption court and its operations, holding the court publicly accountable. Assistance providers um, should also support legal assistance and wraparound services for victims of corruption who are often among the most marginalized. Um, additionally, because the standing anti-corruption court will inherently be focused on accountability for corruption that has already occurred, assistance to an anti-corruption court should be paired with national, regional, and international corruption prevention efforts, um, including embedding transparency, accountability, and integrity principles and mechanisms in public and private sector institutions. Uh, development assistance um, could also be aligned with and complemented by operational support or coordination. A standing anti-corruption court will need to be able to collaborate with national and multilateral um, law enforcement agencies, often in multiple countries on the same, for the same case. Um, this might mean ensuring mutual legal assistance and coordination between the International Anti-Corruption Court and domestic justice institutions, informal information sharing agreements, joint investigations and cooperation in asset seizure, forfeiture and recovery. Um, finally, to taking some lessons from other international criminal tribunals that have worked focused on crimes against humanity into consideration. Um, foreign assistance to an international tribunal can take many forms. Uh, this can include direct funding, often through an international organization like the United Nations, secondments of experts and professionals to the court or tribunal, in-kind support, such as hosting the court or providing prisons in which convicted persons can serve their sentences, technical assistance from implementing partners, especially to stand up a new mechanism. This is something that's currently happening in the Gambia that the Carter Center is part of, is helping um, the Gambia start, establish a hybrid court. Um, knowledge sharing and exchanges and support to CSOs and media um, and support to victims groups. Um, Finally, I would just say that international tribunals are often created to do something that national justice systems are unable or unwilling to do. And um, this is something that I think is in mind with the discussions around an international anti-corruption court. Um, and in other cases, these courts have been situated in other countries and have international staff to protect victims, witnesses, and court staff and avoid the political pressures that domestic justice institutions would face. But considering that corruption is a trans crime and often touches multiple jurisdictions at the same time. A future IACC may not be able to avoid these pressures through ge geography or the nationalities of their staff alone. So additional and likely innovative security and protection measures will likely be required. And I'm going to end it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Hillary. Um, picking up on Hillary's theme about an international anti-corruption court being seen as part of a broader ecosystem um, of complementary mechanisms to address corruption, we're going to move now to a case study of Malaysia, where despite ups and downs, the domestic framework has managed to improve accountability, and yet challenges remain. So the international anti-corruption framework could be improved, including through creation of an IACC that cooperates and complements uh, domestic mechanisms. And here to um, educate us about the Malaysian example is Cynthia Gabriel, Cynthia Gabriel, who is a human rights advocate and anti-corruption leader in Malaysia. She has spent most of her professional life in the field of advancing and promoting human rights, good governance, and democratic freedoms. She founded the Center to Combat Corruption and Cronyism, C4, which is a grantee of the National Endowment of Democracy, which works to promote good governance and conducts a multifaceted project designed to encourage public participation in efforts to combat corruption. Previously, she served as the Vice President of Paris Based Global Advocacy Group, the International Federation for Human Rights, FIDH, and she is a senior advisor to the Center for Independent Private Enterprise. Cynthia, the floor is yours.
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for this opportunity uh, and also to come to the Carter Center. It's really quite a uh, uh, nice uh, feeling to be here. Now, in um, my presentation, from Indonesia we moved to Malaysia. I actually wanted to uh, bring you a real case, a real case of grand corruption and financial crime and heist in which uh, my organization in Malaysia together with many other civil society groups uh, championed in a very dangerous kind of climate to bring very powerful people to account. So when we heard about the initiative to build an international uh, anti-corruption court, uh, we knew that this was one of the very important missing pieces uh, in the whole fight against corruption. And I'll tell you why. So my first objective to uh, bring forward today is to show you the scale of thievery and the scale of looting that actually took place with the grand corruption scandal in Malaysia. So some of you may have heard of the 1MDB scandal that involved a former prime minister. But I'm just going to show you in a couple of slides uh, how this uh, sovereign wealth fund had actually been abused uh, using taxpayers' money uh, and involving various different actors, including this guy here, which is a middleman, who was a very good friend of the Prime Minister and his wife and used his own company to channel about 700 million US dollars into his own company, laundered the money and moved a lot of these around. So I have put it in a PowerPoint slide so that you can see the first tranche, good star. Second tranche is uh, uh, this group, uh, Agba BVI. So from this money that was actually moved around, uh, we find that another couple of billions was moved and what was later exposed by the Department of Justice in the United States was the first time that we in Malaysians actually knew that there was such a scandal that was actually uh, brewing. We had no idea because there was no transparency, no reporting, no accountability, etc. So some parliamentarians tried to ask questions in the local parliament about uh, what is the returns of the sovereign wealth fund, etc. But instead, when the DOJ released released a report on the amount of money that was actually uh, misused to buy a, a Bombardier jet, hotels, uh, partying with Paris Hilton and all kinds of different Hollywood actors. Uh, it was really quite stunning that Malaysia, a fairly small economy in the, in, in the far-flung east, in Southeast Asia, would contribute to one of the largest financial heists. So we learned the hard way about what a kleptocrat leader could do if there was so much abuse of power because he was also the finance minister at that time. So absolute power corrupts absolutely. And in this case, we were actually thrust to the front as anti-corruption civil society groups to find answers. And one of the things that I actually wanted to highlight here is um, this guy in the middle uh, has been the main partner of the uh, prime minister and his wife to actually um, Leo different uh, merchant banks, financial institutions, etc., to actually move money around. And the money moved to so many places, it wasn't just the United States. Later we found out that part of the money that was stolen was also used to make a Hollywood movie, uh, The Wolf on Wall Street. And it involved Leonardo DiCaprio. I mean, the poor guy, he didn't know where the money was coming from. <laughs> but in the investigations that took place, he had to return um, a stolen Marlon Brando award. He had to actually um, uh, come forward to the uh, investigators and tell his side of the story and how much laundered money was actually given to him to lure him to become the actor of that movie and so on and so forth. So there are many different uh, tranches of money that was actually 
uh, utilized, but I wanted to talk about the guy at the bottom. He is the stepson of the Prime Minister, and he was the one that actually, his company was the one that actually got the movie to be produced. And it became a nominated a movie, etc. So the second guy in the middle is our former Prime Minister, and the way it was all concocted was absolutely beyond belief, because it involved EMI records, it involved uh, a whole range of different people uh, to uh, enjoy a luxury life. Uh, a lot of the money was uh, spent on jewelry, on partying, uh, and we're talking here about uh, what's happening now, uh, recovery of assets that are still after eight years. So this scandal was actually exposed in 2015 by the Department of Justice. And in 2018, a 61-year-old government uh, led by the prime minister that we are referring to here and his political party actually fell from power. And that was something absolutely amazing. It was monumental for a country like ours that was always caught by um, a, a very controlled type of elections. So I'm happy to actually stand here at the Carter Center, which has done so much work on electoral reform, et cetera, to tell you that despite the control elections, Corruption can actually bring down governments. And we've seen that not just in Malaysia, but in different settings and in different situations. And it's really important that citizens become the center of how we actually want to develop uh, governance and law reform. So um, enough of this, how the money moved around, because it's so mind boggling until today. Uh, everything that I'm showing you here. Now, one of the things I wanted to talk about is the following um, repercussions of grand corruption. We need a court because if you look at the number of financial institutions that are involved, uh, we're talking about big names, Goldman Sachs, we're talking about uh, merchant banks, JP Morgan, we're talking about a whole range of institutions that were involved in money laundering, that were involved in actually helping move the money from one uh, country to another country to another country. So from 2015 until 2023 today, we're talking about eight years of trying to, number one, recover stolen assets. And asset recovery is a very important part of why we also need a court to um, bring uh, different, um, to bring to trial those uh, people who continue to um, disappear from the whole uh, scenario of uh, responsibility of returning money. Number two, it's also about uh, perpetrators who continue to hide. And we have countries that continue to back them, uh, that continue to protect them. And so this guy here, uh, Joe Lowe, um, continues to be in hiding. Uh, so why do we need an international anti-corruption court? We also have to find those who um, involved, who are charged in absentia, to be tried by an international system. So a big problem that we realize from this whole thing is that many of the investigations are taking place via domestic jurisdiction. The United States investigates uh, the money that was actually stolen from the United States. Switzerland investigates based on their jurisdiction. Singapore, based on their jurisdiction. So some of the success of asset recovery was government to government. So they have returned some of the money. But a lot of the other money is, is lost. Uh, and we're talking about uh, 7.5 billion US dollars that's still out there and is trying to be returned. Um, but um, we are a fairly small economy, so 7.5 billion is about 30 billion uh, local currency, local ringgit. And how many hospitals and schools, 
could be built with that kind of funds. So in conclusion, and I know we don't really have much time, I wanted to say that Malaysia moving forward could be a good example for uh, countries that are struggling with uh, kleptocracies and grand corruption and abuse of power because one of the positive outcomes that we've had is law reform on several aspects. Number one, we've had law reform around uh, corporates and private sector. And we've actually now um, got beneficial ownership uh, provisions incorporated into the Companies Act. Uh, and this is a big deal because it's about corporate transparency. It's no longer about how proxies can be directors and move money around and actually legitimize uh, money laundering. So uh, we have strengthened our anti-money laundering rules. Uh, and it's not just Malaysia, it's also Singapore that has strengthened its money laundering uh, laws because a lot of the money was also uh, looted and laundered uh, via Singapore uh, financial institutions. Uh, the other thing that we have in terms of uh, law reform uh, is uh, around political financing, uh, strengthening of whistleblowing, uh, and the Whistleblower Protection Act, because the, probably the biggest impact was felt by whistleblowers in the country. Uh, and there was just so much harassment, intimidation, arrests, and one of the protest leaders were also uh, arrested under security laws and detained without trial, uh, with false charges of actually accepting American money. Uh, to topple the government and so on and so forth. So the kind of charges that get fabricated is so wild and so uh, um, crazy because there's no definition of how you can actually uh, control uh, the media, the media that was suspended and, and the works. Uh, but the one thing that I wanted to say to use this opportunity to push for a stronger criminal justice system is an international mechanism to go after kleptocrats that continue to hide, to find ways to return uh, stolen assets, and to actually help countries that are moving from a kleptocratic type of uh, Mm, situation towards a transitioning democracy and what actually needs to be done if we are looking at international mechanisms, what can be done at the national level also to support um, institutional reform of such a big uh, nature. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. So having zoomed in on some case studies that illustrate the necessity of an international anti-corruption court, um, our final speaker will address the modalities of the proposal and why an international anti-corruption court is necessary as court of last resort that is able to intervene when domestic or regional mechanisms are unwilling or unable to bring kleptocrats and those who perpetrate uh, grand corruption to justice. Uh, professor Slagyana Tasva is a professor in criminal law and criminology. She is a member of the Academic Advisory Board of the International Anti-Corruption Academy in Luxembourg, Austria. She's a former committee member of the Afghanistan International Anti-Corruption Monitoring and Evaluation Committee, and she's the chair of Transparency International Macedonia. Together with her children, she has established and now leads the U-Risk Consulting Legal Consulting Company. Slagyana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for uh, Citizen for Global Solution and III to include me into this uh, panel, to invite me, and thank you for this opportunity to be in the Carter Center. I share the views of my uh, colleagues here that it is a privilege to be here today, and I hope we will contribute to the discussion whether we need an international anti-corruption court or not. So yes, I was kind of invited to, and thank you for the nice introduction on uh, what we have done in all our lives. I see we all have a lot of experience in working in, in anti-corruption, so we know what we are talking about. Um, I will also mention a few things about my own country, Macedonia, even though when I, uh, I said this morning to Dr. Escobar, I sign everything what she says. It's 
very similar to what is happening in, in my country. It is, as, unlike Indonesia, it is a very small country of two million people. But uh, being a small country of two million people, uh, in the past three years we have like uh, one quarter, 500,000 officially declared as moved from the country because they are, this is the brain drain situation. Young people and old people who will have opportunity are leaving the country because they see it as a country of no hope. The trust of in, in our pro public prosecution is 3%. The trust in the judiciary is 4%. So it is very, um, uh, it has been officially declared as a captured state uh, in the EU progress, progress report. It was not a civil society, it's an official report from the European Commission saying that this is the captured state. And it is a, a country in, tra in transition for already 30 years. And since 2005, at that time we were kind of making some progress. We became candidate for the European Commission and we have still not started negotiations. And uh, I'm making this point to say how important it is for this de uh, transition, uh, not, uh, not developed democracies, how important is that international support and cooperation, or even international oversight. Nothing is happening in this country if it is not pushed or overseen from outside. If somebody will not say in any kind of report, this is what we see, this is how it is uh, progressing, or the latest report from this year of the European uh, uh, Commission was that there is no progress in the anti-corruption and there is no progress in the reforms. So after so many years of transition, we are still where even worse than it was before. And there is high level of impunity. And in this situation, when there is no um, uh, influence from any side and nobody can influence to what is happening in the country because the only hope is European Commission, it is a weak economy. The political environment is such that there is a coalition uh, government. It is uh, based on the uh, international agreement that it will be always the coalition. And these are the same people that are changing in power and they are actually not interested in the reforms. The only thing that they are interested in, in is the own political interest and their personal interests. Uh, that's why for some time we can see that we are adopting or improving into the legislation and institutional settlement, but, some, but after that it is going backwards. Recently the criminal law was changed and uh, the sentencing uh, for the ab abuse of the official duty and of the use of official duty in the cases of procurement and the use of public money, the sentences were decreased, which made the all about 200 cases of high level corruption to reach the statute of limitation and to be outdated and actually they were not resolved in the courts. And there are many things that, uh, and politicians are always doing that they, they don't care if after that it was written in the report saying that they have abused the European flag and pushed that law through the parliament uh, in 48 hours. It is done. There, there will, because now there will be elections and they want to make sure that the political opponents will be there to, to cooperate because uh, <coughs> formally they are opponents, but in the background, they all work very good together in their businesses. So these type of societies, when there is kind of no rule of law, uh, no democracy, institutions are very weak, uh, there is a lot of intimidation, even if somebody will try to do his job properly, then there is a threat that they will lose their job, so people are self-censoring. And it is a society which needs something to be done in order to, uh, to 
create some basis for some hope. This is the pessimistic or the, the, the situation in the country. What we have been doing well, uh, always the triggers for changing in the, changes in the society were international uh, uh, tre treaties, international institutions, uh, the same also in the fight against crime and corruption. We have always been good in signing and ratifying international conventions. So we have, we can start from the Convention for the Narcotic Drugs and Precursors from 88, where it all started when we started talking about organized crime with drug dealing and uh, for the first time about money laundering. And then the, the Palermo Convention in 2000, then the UNCAC, then the Council of Europe Conventions on Incrimination of the uh, Corruption, then the Anti-Money Laundering uh, Conventions. Everything, every single convention we have ratified and all our laws are harmonized with the international standards. So we have it. And we have established all the necessary institutions. Uh, in all institutions for investigation, FIUs for the money laundering, special, uh, the, the Anti-Corruption Commission was established in 2002. I was the first chair of that commission. Also have been in Tunisia for drafting the principles for the Anti-Corruption Commissions. And then we had the special public prosecutor because our prosecutor has always been bottleneck for the rule of law. So there was the international decision to create a special prosecutor. Now that special prosecutor is in jail for corruption. All the cases were back to the general prosecutor. So it is kind of situation which is really a situation with no, uh, no uh, light in the tunnel. People really don't know to whom to trust. And still you can see that uh, the biggest hope is to become a member of the European Union because then it, there will be oversight from outside, all these reporting mechanisms, etc. And everything what we have done, changing the laws and creating institutions, we have done due to this international. We want to look good from outside. But what is happening inside is a completely different story. And now to come to the um, International Anti-Corruption Court and why we are talking about it even in the country and why we participate into this discussion to decide what type of mechanism to increase effectiveness in the fight against corruption is needed. It is obvious that even now after 20 years of UNCAC, uh, today on this COSP we are talking about great uh, new initiatives and ideas. Today I heard very good uh, uh, results from the STAR initiatives and conf uh, assets recovery and also mentioned here from Malaysia and other countries and developing a different type of uh, uh, methods to address some aspects of corruption, bringing beautiful resolutions, but that is all uh, still in the area of policy making, uh, creating standards, and there will be another institution that will be dealing with these uh, standards, but still we will not reach the level of effectiveness. What is missing in all this arena, because uh, we have FATF group that is following what is happening in the anti-money laundering world. We have the Egmont group exchanging information on money laundering. We have STAR initiative working. We have the networks of prosecutors, networks of judges. And for me, another point that is missing, yesterday we had discussion how to bring together UNTAC and UNCAC the two conventions which are about fighting organized crime and about addressing problems with corruption. For a practitioner, and I've lived, lived through all this, it is kind of not acceptable that we need to talk about bringing these instruments together. 
they should function together. We need to have international court where all these possibilities for joint investigations, joint prosecution of cases, exchanging of information and, and data, it is a global convention which gives us ground for this type of cooperation. And all countries here have signed and ratified that. And we have um, UNCAC convention signed and ratified by the biggest number of the countries on the globe. And we are still talking how to bring this together. They all work in silos, isolated, not talking to each other, but they exist. We have Europol, beautiful big building in The Hague. I see my colleague from the Netherlands, so that's why it came to my mind. We have Interpol, we have everything. But we don't have effectiveness in the fight against crime in general. Even if some group of drug dealers is uh, 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 arrested or found, we, there is no discussion about where the money or who enabled this man, uh, to happen. The customs, the police, whatever. So this is why this is a missing element on the international architecture on the fight against organized crime and corruption. We cannot uh, divide these two because we are also talking about grand corruption and about organized corruption. Now we have special typology of corruption, which is just organized corruption. It is not related to, to some other type of organized crime. So that is why I think we need to keep this discussion alive, keep it going. And there might be um, ups and downs to think about the modality, what type of modality this court will be, whether it will be like the ICC, whether it will be like the ICTY. A lot of uh, international uh, courts have been created. But we, we have learned from these courts, but that is also a very good experience they can, we can use. And these modalities of uh, having it as a court that it will work on demand, that it is not necessary that all countries are members, that it will address problems in the countries through the members' uh, countries. It is still in development. The, the I, I, IIII is working on the treaty, and it will be offered for the discussion, and I think this discussion should be discussion about effectiveness. It should not be only about the court, or if not this court, what else? How can we really think about effectiveness in the fight against corruption? Because it is uh, affecting all of us. We cannot say it is affecting only uh, weak democracies or not developed countries. We see it a lot in the developed countries. And they are the biggest enablers, if you want to be honest. So a lot of money are coming here or going to, to England or somewhere else. So that's why we are talking about this. And this is what is missing in all this international uh, architecture and landscape on fight against crime. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, I'm reminded that it is not only the 75th anniversaries of the Genocide Convention and the United, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights this year. It's also the 25th anniversary of the Rome Statute, and there are important lessons learned from the formation and the continued evolution of the International Criminal Court. My organization was proud to be one of the founding members of the coalition for the ICC, and I come to you actually from the Assembly of States parties last week, where my organization, along with Human Rights Watch, um, Atrocities Watch Africa, and Al Haq, had a panel on double standards in justice, where we looked at the perception and reality of um, a, what has been called a, a sim, in, asymmetrical uh, application of international law. So it is important that at the outset we consider the prophylactic measures that need to be taken to ensure the independence and effectiveness of an international anti-corruption court as Integrity Initiatives International has been doing. We have just a few minutes. I'm informed by the organizers we can go a couple minutes long for a question and answer and discussion. Um, I would kindly ask you to use the microphones that I believe are going to be circulated as this event is being recorded. And if you could kindly um, indicate uh, yes, I think we have standing microphones here. Um, if you could kindly indicate your name and organizational affiliation and if your question is directed to a particular one of our panelists. 
Please, madam. Put it on. Yes, yes, okay, great. sorry. Uh, my name is Luzwies van der Laan. As uh, my colleague Sladjana already pointed out, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, uh, I'm with Transparency International Netherlands. Uh, I used to work at the International Criminal Court, uh, and I'm really uh, happy to see you kind of looking at the lessons learned from that. I'm going to be very Dutch and direct about the challenges facing the International Criminal Court because I think it's extremely important uh, to make sure that if there's going to be uh, an anti corruption court, that you don't make any of these mistakes. I've also worked at Eurojust, so I've seen how cooperation with prosecutors can work, and I think we have a lot to learn from that. So um, there is the huge problem of the north-south uh, you know, bias, the idea. So in the Kenya case, one of the things that went wrong, of course, it was very easy for opponents of the court to say, look, it's a bunch of white guys sitting in The Hague, uh, very far away from the conflict, uh, and they played the whole post-colonial race element. This is very sensitive. So I think one of the key recommendations I think should be do not put it in the global north um, because it has to be owned or maybe even make it regional but it would have to be owned uh, not, not by some of the usual I would say uh, suspects, the European Union or the US etc. Um, the other thing which has been very challenging is it's very expensive. The ICC costs 150 million a year. Most of that go to huge UN salaries. Um, not always having a lot to show for it. If you look at some of the judges that you know haven't been involved in cases because they're conflicted or these kind of things, so I think this is an, would be another important lesson: is try not to make it a UN organization. Uh, one of the problems there is you get the negotiations whereby whether someone a country gets a judge is not because you have the best judge, but it's because you were able to make a deal to vote for. You guys get the Human Rights Commission, you get to be on the Security Council, whatever. You want to get away from the New York horse training. That's really important. Try to get the justice ministries involved and not the foreign ministries involved. And I think the final one um, uh, that I, is, is not so much link, linked to the ICC, but also because I was uh, together with Canada, one of the sponsors of a resolution adopted uh, by Transparency International, by the global movement, um, about that we have to make sure that the energy invested in a possible court in the future does not take away from the resources that we need to do all the work at the local, sub-local, and at the regional level. Because at best, um, this court will if it ever comes to fruition in the future, if most countries join, that's going to be other interesting ones. I've heard US, you know, the US government say we will never ever join one of these. We know with the ICC, we don't have the usual suspects. We don't have China, we don't have Russia, we don't have others. So this is going to be an important, I think, question to tackle, um, is, is how do we, we make sure that we don't take away resources, which are lacking in many ways, from actually strengthening local capacity, getting regional actors to work together and doing all of that. And at the event hosted by the Dutch and the Canadian government with uh, for, then Foreign Minister Bobke Hoekstra, uh, UNODC said, look, we have more than 10,000 technical assistance requests, which we cannot honor because we simply don't have the funds. And so you have governments and you have specialized organizations who want to do the right thing, but just don't have the capacity. So I think what's really important is that we always remember, it was one of the reasons that Transparency International as a global movement has not put its weight behind the court, because we want to make sure that it doesn't come instead of, or doesn't take away from this really important uh, priority. So thank you for that, and good luck with your endeavors. Thank you so much for those very concrete recommendations. Um, I will highlight, and then I see you, Madam, as our, our next um, contribution from the floor. Um, I will highlight that the independent expert review that concluded this year of the International Criminal Court um, was led in part by Justice Richard Goldstone, who is one of the co-chairs of Integrity Inter um, Initiatives International. Um, and that yielded some very important recommendations, including um, to the points raised um, just now, around judicial uh, elections and judicial vetting. Um, and we saw that in action to some extent last week when six new judges were elected before the ICC. But those recommendations did not come um, uh, before years of civil society advocacy um, and the legal community rallying for the improvement of the ICC. And so this is something that is being considered at the outset in a treaty for an IACC. Um, so I'll take the next intervention from the floor and then come to our panel to see if they have any reactions to both of these. Okay, my name is Esther Basaris. I'm a member of parliament from Kenya. Uh, Dr. Claudia Escobar, um, 
You mentioned a new generation of judges. Um, you know, when you got in, it was a new generation of judges with the desire to do good. Um, has that been lost or is there still, because now you're here in the US and I'm just thinking, um, you're sharing your story, but is there a way to get a new generation of judges, not just uh, in your country, but across the globe? You know, I mean, like um, we had, uh, I'm in the opposition in Kenya and we had a ruling by the judges um, um, in the, the judiciary made a ruling in terms of the election. And when they did, there was all these rumors about how much each political party paid. And you know, it was kind of sad to hear that. And this expression, why hire a judge when you can, uh, why hire a lawyer when you can buy a judge is so rampant in, in developing countries. So I'm just thinking um, with your experience, um, are you working with judiciaries all over the world to see how they can be bold? Because it requires boldness you know, to come out and and say, hey, we're gonna do something right. Because something's got to give. If it's not the legislator, if it's not the, the executive, then the judiciary. In Kenya, we've seen the judiciary be bold, but I feel that they need that extra push to clean up. And when you're talking about the international court, I really agree that we we cannot, I, I think I, I see this revival uh, of the global south saying that, you know, we want our, our own solutions, we want to be part of the solutions. And, you know, you've got the East African uh, legislator, you've got Pan-African legislation. If there was a way that uh, you could kind of, um, if we could push finances to make them improve their um, election bodies, improve their judicial processes, um, I think it could work because Kenya, out of 20 years of not having law reports, just by funding, we're up to date with law reports, which is fantastic for judicial reforms. So I feel that the, the financing that is required, and you know, it's how do you consume an elephant uh, one bite at a time? And I just feel that the global south requires that support so that it's like, it's your solution, we're just here to support you. Do you want to improve your electoral processes? We're here to support you, we're giving you the experts. And I feel that we can move that way. If we have a court in East Africa, that, that and we do have one, if it can be strengthened, then we can deal with corruption, because people do go to the East African court. I remember Martha Karo was not very happy with the judicial process in Kenya. They went to the East African court. It might not give you the decision you want because of course there's collaboration between the East African states, but it's a step in the right direction. So I just wanna know, is that generation of judges that want change, is it still there? And how can it be kept fueled? Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Um, perhaps, uh, Dr. Escobar, since that last question was addressed directly to you, if you want to take that, and then if any of our panelists have reflections on the first question, and I'm mindful we only have a few minutes left, and I don't want to keep people from our next panel in about five minutes' time. Yes, I, I want to be optimistic. I think that there's always windows of opportunities for um, judges to, to defend the rule of law. I think that being a judge requires a uh, vocation, you know, motivation, and it will depend in, in, in different countries. I am involved with different organizations that are looking after the appointment of judges, um, betting, you know, uh, all this process, and I think that's, that's important. I just want to, to make a final remark that for many countries around the world, the, the fight against corruption is totally asymmetrical. And it's an international epidemic with negative, negative impacts for millions of people. We, we've seen it here, different countries that are, are facing a corruption. And the victims of corruption are alone where corruption is systemic. So as a former judge, I really believe that the best tool to fight corruption is the independence of a, a judiciary. And I think the International Anti-Corruption Court could and should guarantee the independent and impartial judges to address the cases of, of grand corruption in countries where the influence of kleptocrats or where corruption is endemic is in place. So I really will like to invite every one of you to, to back up this effort to create an International Anti-Corruption Court. I think we're at time. Is there any last remark? 
Thank you. Um, so it remains for me to thank our um, esteemed panelists, um, our co-sponsoring organization, Triple I, who next year will be able to participate in person at the Conference of States parties, uh, thanks to a historic vote yesterday uh, that lends greater inclusivity for civil society participation. And of course, our hosts here at the Carter Center. Thank you all so very much.